Hello, my name is Pastor JT. I'm blessed to be a pastor here at Cross Culture Church. Welcome to our online service this morning. We're so glad that you're here and we're grateful for you joining us today. Although we do miss seeing everyone in person. You see, we typically meet at the Regis Groff campus off of 51st and Tower Road in Green Valley Ranch, Colorado. We can't wait until this stay at home order is over because we look forward to seeing and meeting everyone again in person. However, we are thankful for the tools that God has given us in this time to connect and learn more about who we are in Jesus and the plans he has for us. So here's what you can do to provide the best experience possible. We'll be hosting this service on our website, greatneighbors.net. Uh, it's probably how you got here. Uh, and we're also going to be on Facebook Live. If you go to our Facebook Live page, be sure to hop on the chat and say hello to us. Letting us know that you're with us is awesome and lets other people see, you know, hopefully everyone around the area who's all hanging out with us and who's hanging out with God. Saying hey, uh, hi to us can make all the difference in the world. Also, reach out to us for prayer. Ask us questions. You can do this by filling out our Connect card on our website menu. Most of all, be engaged. Engage this morning in, in worship with Jasmine and Engage in the message with Michael, but just be blessed. You see, we serve a God that meets us everywhere. So when the announcements come, pay attention. Stay tuned to find out even more tools you can use to grow and connect to Jesus and to others. So pull out a notebook, take notes during this message. You're going to be glad that you did. Remember, if you need anything, reach out to us at info at crossculturedenver.org. Again, that's info at crossculturedenver.org. Enjoy the service, and again, we're so glad to be with you today. God bless. Culture Church. Uh, we are excited to worship with you. We had such a great time worshiping last week, laughing together, dancing together, um, and we're excited that you're back here again. Um, we're also joyful that we have new people here for the first time, so welcome to you as well. Um, I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer, and we're going to worship the Lord. But first, um, let's make sure to connect with each other, so of course look around at the people that you're worshiping with at home, say good morning, good evening, hello. Um, but also jump us in the comments and say hello to somebody you've been missing lately. Let me open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for another chance to worship you. Um, thank you for your son. Um, Lord, thank you that we can just find rest and peace in you. Lord, I pray that today as we worship, as we fellowship, as we hear from your word, that you would fill us up, God. Prepare us to go out and be your people, um, to be a light to a world in need. Thank you for your life, and thank you for your love. To Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen.
and good morning, everyone. This is Delanda Adams, and I am here to do your announcements this morning. You know, I miss having Miss Patty Sand to roll these beautiful bean uh, slides for uh, for us every Sunday. But you know, I gotta figure this out on my own. So. We're going to go forward. Thank you, Patty, so much for everything that you do for us here at Cross Culture. For all of our new people who are listening and watching in with us for the very first time, we want you to go over to greatneighbors.net and there we have a digital connect card and a digital prayer card. We want to connect with you and, and find out what your, your needs are uh, and, and just get to know a little bit more about you and even pray for you. We have our prayer words that are waiting by uh, to intercede and go to the Father on your behalf. And next we have our online gatherings. If you all don't know, we have been having a blast. Um, we have something cooked up for you almost every day of the week and you don't have to do it all, but you can come in because you don't have to uh, weather all of this that we're going through alone. You can come in and join in on the fun and the fellowship. Mondays, we have uh, our director, Mindy, that hosts something for the kids. And I've heard through the grapevine that they have a blast and even they're so excited to see the, their other little friends that they will fellowship with on, um, on Sundays. And then on Tuesdays, we have our Bible study. And right now we are going through the book of Mark. On Wednesdays, we have our life groups. You can always go to our website as well to find out how you too can get connected to a life group. Have you a little bit of pocket of family uh, of your own. And then on Thursdays, join Miss uh, Jasmine and she always has something uh, cooked up. She has worship and rest. Bring your crowns, bring your crowns or what or whatnot and just soak in God's presence with her. And then on Friday, you can join me. Um, I'm online uh, to pray. I'm on there with the prayer team. We give a, a small, a small message and we go to the throne of grace on your behalf there as well. So join us for one of our online gatherings. You can go to greatneighbors.net and get the calendar of what we have cooking up each day. Next, we have our giving. Yay! It is one of the ways that we worship here at Cross Culture. And why is giving so important? It is important because it is one of the ways that we show God that he comes first in everything that we do. And that includes our giving. That includes our finances. And so uh, you can do that in three ways. You can go to what? You can go to our website at greatneighbors.net and go to the giving tab. You can text, you can text cross, you can text seven uh seven seven nine seven seven and then uh text cross culture and then you will get the prompts so that you can be able to give. And last but not least, you can give through the mail. Yes, we know some of you all, you still like the mail and I ain't mad at you because I still do that with a lot of things as well. So um, go online so that you can give and worship God in that way. And then we want you all to come back next week because our next series is entitled I love my church. All right now, and I know you have seen people that have on, on their t-shirts that say, I love my church. Do you have a church that you love? If you don't, we need you to come back because the, and, and, and now, now is the time of more than ever that you need to be connected to a spiritual family because you need all the encouragement that you can get. So come back, everybody. Come and listen to next week's series. I love my church. I know that you are going to be abundantly blessed. Thank you for letting me come into your home for just these few minutes. I thank you and I do not take it lightly. Enjoy the service. You all be blessed. Bye-bye. Welcome to Cross Culture Church Online. My name is Pastor Michael. 
Uh, it's such a privilege to be here with you. Thank you for joining us online. We believe that we can still connect and reach even in a time like this. And you might be wondering why I'm drinking water out of a pink cup and in a room full of pink pictures. It's because I'm in my beautiful daughter's room. Monet, Monet. Yes, say hello. Yes, say hello to everybody. Say hi. Yeah, say hi. Say hi. <laughs> Monet's letting us use her room because we're talking about a mighty woman of God who faced trials and overcame. And I believe, Monet, you're a beautiful, mighty woman of God. Amen? Oh. Amen. All right. Well, today, yeah, we're going to talk about an awesome story, and Monet has let us use her room. In fact, we speak this scripture over her that she's clothed in strength. No angle, my picture. That's right. And I'm dignity. No angle, my picture. And right laughs now. Cool. at the future because she has God behind her. So thank you. Say goodbye, Monet. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Here's Mama. All right. She wants candy. <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Monet, let us use her room because we're going to talk about an amazing woman of God. In fact, as we finish our series, Rule of Life, I was stuck on two stories. Usually I plan way out. And, and But this season has been week to week, and a lot of you can relate to that. But I, I was stuck between two stories, and I asked some people online, hey, what, what do you want to hear about? And one of the ways that we can really see God move is through his people. And Latara, uh, a, a female in our church, said she'd love to hear about this woman, which we'll talk about here in a second. And a bunch of people liked it. So God is speaking. That was one of the stories that was on my heart. So I'm excited to share this with you before we get started with the story. I just want to talk to you about how powerful this series, uh, Rule of Life, has been. We've been looking at in, in an unconstant season and, and lots of uncertainty and ups and downs, some things that we can do in order to find stability and consistency. And not just a stability for the season, but a stability that lasts forever. And a rule of life is simply scheduling your life around Jesus Christ. Scheduling your life in a way that you allow him to teach you on a daily basis, that you experiencing experience him and his people, and in turn you become all that God wants you to be. And the beautiful thing about becoming all that God wants you to be is that his purpose comes to earth and his glory comes. There's nothing more important in this life than you focusing on who you become. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But today as we dive into this story about a woman who changes the face of history for a nation and really us today, I'm excited for us to focus in on something that God wants us to in this season. So as we get started, I'd love for you to open up to the book of Esther. It's a powerful story today and I'm excited to share with you. But let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you can meet us even in uncertainty, even in the midst of trials. Lord, you meet us on the mountaintop and you meet us in the valley. And today, Lord, as we talk about the significance of who we are in Jesus, meet us here, God. Speak to us. Lord, I thank you that, that people are tuning in, and that's not by chance, God, but it's for a reason. And the reason is for your glory, but in turn... It also makes us better. So thank you so much. Bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to open up with a question before we get into Esther. I want to ask you in this season, what have you been focusing on? Have you been focusing on the normal things like your image, pleasing people, uh, not being a disappointment, trying to have control Focusing on nothing and just literally being an idle mind. And, and we, know, we know what the saying is that the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Have we been focusing on laziness? Have we been focusing on things that don't last, right? And, and today as we talk about Esther, we're going to see that your focus is the most important thing that you can have. And, and the truth is, is, straight up, in the beginning of this message, I'm going to tell you that you need to focus on who you are becoming. Because that dictates your decision, your reactions, and your response. That all those other things, your image, money, control, all those things, people-pleasing, you name it, 
All those things don't last in the face of trials. But when we focus on who we're becoming, that is to become more like Jesus and children of God, that lasts. So do, do me a favor real quick. Go online and check in on Facebook and maybe say hashtag for such a time as this. Or go on Instagram and tag us in a story. We need more of a presence on Instagram. So do that as well. But let somebody know that you're joining us at Cross Culture Church for Church Online. And you could change a life forever. You could, even by sharing, be living in your purpose. So today as we look at Esther, it's a beautiful story, historically true we're going to begin to understand how important it is for us to focus on who we're becoming because that helps us stay in aligned with God's purpose. You see, many of you know this, but there's other purposes than God's purpose for your life. And many of us have lived in those purposes. And, and, and I once heard uh, a pastor preach on those purposes outside of God and he called them shadow purposes. What are those purposes that are in the shadow that lead to darkness that don't last? What are those things that you focus on that eventually will deteriorate and be destroyed? You say, for many of us, we think that we can focus on God, but also mix in other things, even if it's just 10 degrees to the left. And the truth is, is we're just 10 degrees away from facing the pit of hell, facing destruction and ruin in darkness. So today we're going to look at a woman who in the face of a shadow purpose, another purpose, she overcomes. And I want to tell you that a rule of life is so important because it helps you stand the test of time and trials and live in God's purpose. So open up your Bibles to Esther chapter 1. We're going to get started. The Word of God is so important. So let's go ahead and begin. It says this in chapter 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Kush. Here we see, maybe you've seen the movie 300, where there's this uh, King Xerxes who's carried in with really millions of people in his army in this glamour. And really, that's kind of what the author is trying to do here for you and I. He wants you to know that this king who oversees 127 provinces is powerful. One of the most powerful kings in man-made history. And you'll see that, that this whole book is divided up into banquets. And really, banquets and parties were a way for a king to show how amazing he is. Was And here we see that in verse 4 when it says, For a full 180 days he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and the glory of his majesty. Six months of showing off. And today you might have a hard time following uh, me through the scripture because we're going to tell the whole story of Esther. So if you want to take notes, that's going to be the best thing to do or have your Bible open and be ready to go. But I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this story. And in the beginning, we see this story is solely focused on the fact that King Xerxes is a man that's really not sure of himself, is a man that lives in his shadow purpose, that is to please others and to let them know who is the most glamorous in the world. He's not a man of character, of God-given purpose. And we even see this in verse 7 in, in this banquet. He has wine which was served in goblets of gold, and each one was different from the other. And the royal wine was in abundance. It, in, in keeping with the king's liberality, right, the king's command, his glamour, he lets each guest drink as much as they want. It's an open bar at this feast and party, and he does it just to show off. But there's also another banquet going on at this time as Xerxes shows everybody how amazing he is. There's a banquet led by his queen at the time, Queen Vashti. And this one's not as glamorous. In fact, there's only women at this banquet celebrating. But Xerxes at his banquet starts to get 
a little tipsy and, and drunk and decides to send for Queen Vashti. In fact, it says this in chapter 1, verse 11. It says, to bring before him a queen, right, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the nobles, for she was lovely to look at. Could you imagine Right, feeding the shadow purpose for Queen Vashti was displaying and objectifying her beauty before men. Right, that's what she had to give up, and it's really sad to think that the shame that she might have experienced—that literally her purpose was to be a trophy, and that was it. And and what's interesting is, is something happens here when King Xerxes calls his queen to display how amazing she is, and in turn fuel his shadow purpose of ego, she says no. She doesn't want to come and be displayed. She doesn't want to hang out at, at this party where men are doing keg stands and drinking Zima, right? No, they didn't have Zima back then. I don't even think they have Zima now, but she's like, I'm not down with that. Heck no, I'm not going to be an object of display and King Xerxes says oh I'm so sorry I want to value no he doesn't say that in fact he gets angry and ticked off because she's challenging his shadow purpose a man who is in control and a man who is of great power and then and then this happens it says later on that she says no and Xerxes doesn't know what to Xerxes doesn't know what to do so he turns to his royal servants, men educated in the law, really his supreme court of the day. This most powerful king in the world can't even control his wife. Could you imagine, you guys, if we could call upon the supreme court to settle a dispute between our wives and I? The truth is, is my wife would probably win and be right before the court anyway, right? But, but Xerxes is upset and he doesn't know what to do so he has these men around him who are ear ticklers tell him, you know what, you need to set the example with Vashti. She can't get away with this because if she does, all the women through the provinces are going to think that they can disrespect their men and, and do whatever they want. So Xerxes makes this decree saying now Queen Vashti cannot come in his presence anymore, which I think is a gift, right? And then... All throughout the land, this decree says that because of what Queen Vashti did, women will have to respect their husbands and submit to their rule. And what's sad here is this Supreme Court is feeding Xerxes' shadow purpose, feeding his ego. And the truth is the reason that they're doing this is because they're stuck in their own shadow purpose. They desire more and greed and self-promotion. And the sad thing is, is that, that we become so concerned about our own shadow purposes, right? Our own self-interest self -interest, that we are, are not even interested in challenging somebody else's. King Xerxes surrounds himself with ear ticklers in this whole process and I've seen this happen in this world I won't I won't worry about what's best for you because I'm going to worry about what's best for me and you know what let's not offend people and just let, let's just let them choose whatever they want let's let's let them decide who they are and whatever they want and not mess with that there aren't people in this world or are enough people per se challenging people with what's true in real, in fact, they were so concerned about pleasing his perception of reality, his distortion of reality, that they didn't bring the true reality before him. And so because of this, Xerxes gets off, gets away. They put out the decree and he begins to search for a new wife. And the good news is, is that God even works in broken situations. Amen? So Xerxes decides to put on this huge 10 times Miss, Uni Miss Universe contest across all 127 provinces to find out who his new wife is going to be. And his counsel are his servants, people that are going to tell him what he wants to hear. And what is Xerxes' metric? It's beauty. It's objectifying a woman. It's a new trophy that Queen Vashti decided not 
to be. And it just so happens in the midst of this broken circumstance that one of the contestants was a Jewish girl named Esther. In fact, she was an orphan and was adopted by her cousin Mordecai. And she gets entered into this competition. She goes through the districts, the regionals, the state, the, the nationals, and then ends up a, as a final contestant, one of the 127. And she wins because she's beautiful and fair. And, and she pleases the king. She's the ultimate trophy wife. And Esther, we see here, has a shadow purpose right in front of her to chase. In fact, in this moment, she pushes aside who she truly is to pursue that shadow purpose, one of, of praise, one of glamour and wealth and all these things and comfort. But she finds favor with the king in the midst of all these things. And her cousin Mordecai, who's outside of the city courts, hears about an assassination plot against Xerxes' life. And he tells Esther about it. And Esther lets Xerxes know. And Xerxes takes care of this assassination plot and is grateful to Mordecai for what he had done. So more favor for Esther. But then we see in this context of this new queen, Esther, another character enter the story, a man named Haman. You see, Haman is a stronger leader even than Xerxes is. And because of that, he, he, he rises up through the ranks and becomes the most noble of all the council, noble of all the men, and everybody begins to worship him. But he, in his shadow purpose, finds something that he doesn't like. And gets offended. And that is that there's this one man that won't worship him. This one man that won't bow down to him and worship him. And that man is Mordecai. Esther's cousin. And Xerxes, being who he is, hears about this from Haman and doesn't really do any research. Haman goes, hey, there's this man that won't worship me. I need to be worshipped. That's who I am. That's where I get my identity, right? And he tells Xerxes, hey, I'm going to pay you more money than the provinces give you in one month. All 127 provinces give you for their taxes. And this is like millions and millions of dollars. And Xerxes being who he is stuck in his shadow purpose, doesn't even think about it and says, that's fine. What do you want to do? And he goes, I need this man to be killed and I need his people to be killed. And unfortunately, Xerxes says it's okay because there's nobody there to challenge his shadow purpose. He doesn't even care because he's stuck in other things. And this decree and edict is written for Mordecai and all of the people of God to be demolished. And when Mordecai hears about this, he becomes like anyone would in the face of death, distraught and freaked out. Out And Esther hears about this, so she sends her servants to figure out what is going on with Mordecai. And Mordecai doesn't know what's going to happen, but he knows one thing, that for such a time as this, there is only one person who has been positioned to save Mordecai and the people of God, and that is Esther, the beauty queen, the harem girl, the one who denied her identity earlier. And Mordecai charges Esther. He sends the servant back and he tells her, you need to save the people of God. This is the time to do it. And Esther responds as her palms get sweaty and she has anxiety rise up in her like, I don't know if I can do that. Because if she would go to the king without an appointment she would face death immediately in her current purpose of glamour and wealth and comfort would all go away. And you would think most friends would stop there. Okay, I get it. You, you, you don't want to do this. Maybe there's another way. I don't know. But Mordecai doesn't. He's the type of friend that calls out 
her shadow purpose. And he says this in verse 12. He says, when Esther's words were reported in Mordecai, he sent back this answer. He says, do not think because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Remember who you are. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place. But you and your family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther, you know who you are. This is the time for you to decide in light of that. You are a child of God and God has positioned you in this broken, crazy circumstance for such a time as this. Remember who you are because Esther has the fate of God's covenant, his people, and his purpose, and his dreams in her hands. He, Mordecai says, you haven't been given this comfort, this beauty, for your own purpose. You've been given this beauty for a greater purpose, the purpose to save the world and continue God's plans. You have come to be called into all that God wants you to be, almighty warrior and because Esther has Mordecai somebody challenging that shadow purpose she calls to the people and she says this she says then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai it says go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me do not eat or drink for three days night or day and I and my attendants will fast as you do as well Esther's rule of life has her refusing to achieve God's given purpose or any purpose on her own strength and beauty. In fact, Esther's rule of life in the face of trial, in the face of temptation of a shadow purpose is to surrender to God, to fast and pray. And I want to ask you this question. We need to answer this for those who follow Christ. When was the last time that you had an extended amount of time with your Father in heaven who loves you and who created you? When was the last time that you sat at his feast, that you fasted, that you let go of things you normally lean on and, and allow God to fulfill that hunger in thirst. When was the last time that you joined us for a prayer night on Friday night? We do it every night. All you got to do is join a Zoom call or dial in or tune in to Facebook Live. When was the last time that you prayed? Because that's uh, something that you need to do as a rule of life to remind you of who you are and the direction that you should go. You should never ever go in a direction without asking God first. What is your plan in this? Without looking to his word, what is your plan with this? And without looking to his people, what is God's plan in this? And we've all made that decision. We've all tried to do things on our own strength in the face of trials and decisions. And we know those don't last and, and never work out well. And Esther's response in the midst of this prayer and fasting her response is even bolder than Mordecai's challenge. She says, when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther knows who, she's, who she is and who she is. Her courage is greater than her beauty. In a world where the church, even the church and society have told women just to be objects of beauty and keep silent, right? To be second best. This story reminds us that a woman had more boldness and integrity and character than any man in this story. And in this story, the word of God we see because of a woman's leadership and a woman's courage not giving in to a shadow purpose of glamour and comfort and ease in the American dream or whatever it is, you name it. We see that this woman saved the very men that doubted her. So I say to you, as I said to my daughter in the beginning of this message, 
You be mighty women of God. All of you women out there, it is time for you to lead. Even when men aren't leading, it is time for you to lead because we serve a God that has a plan and a purpose. And he will use those who are willing to focus on their true purpose in him. And I pause in the midst of this as we talk about purpose. And I want to ask you a few questions. And I start with this question. What has been your shadow purpose? What has been your shadow purpose? Purpose. What is the thing that pulls you and drifts you away from God's plan for your life? What is the thing that interrupts you on focusing and becoming like Jesus? What is that? Can you name it? You see, I can name mine in a few words. I played baseball in high school and, and growing up in college. And, and I remember there was this tournament that I was in. Uh, in my high school years in another state and, 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 and I had a great tournament and, and the, the newspaper had followed and it, and it wrote about it and it said this about me. It said, Michael Winokur never ceases to please. Those words are my shadow purpose. You see, my shadow purpose is to please and appease and get affirmation and it's it's a purpose that leads to destruction and even in my best effort to please it's challenged my character it's challenged my integrity it's challenged my morality and more and you know what this is a battle that I will face for the rest of of my life, but as long as I remember who I am and schedule my life around who Jesus is and what his teachings are and experience the Holy Spirit, that shadow purpose will stay in the dark and never come true. But I ask you, can you name your shadow purpose? Are you even aware of it? You see, it goes all the way back to the fall, this idea of shadow purpose. Adam and Eve were created with a purpose to be the image of God. But the, the, the serpent said to them, you should eat the apple so you know what your purpose truly is. So your eyes will open. You can't trust God that he's enough for you. You have to have even more. And you see, Adam and Eve gave in to that shadow purpose. For Solomon, it was greed and lust. For Jonah, it was escape, running away. You ever, you ever, you ever had that shadow purpose where it, when times get tough, you just want to run? I've seen that in people in my life. Simon wanted to have the greatest ministry ever. And that was his shadow purpose and it seemed good. And here's the thing, like I mentioned earlier, our shadow purposes sometimes aren't as blatant and, and as obvious that it can even be mixed in in, in, in in good things. But even 10 degrees off from God's purpose leads us to hell. Partial disobedience is still full disobedience. What? is your shadow purpose. The next question I have to ask you, and it's the purpose of why we exist and gather as a church. Who is the Mordecai in your life or multiple Mordecais? Do you have a Mordecai in your life that can call you out when you're living in your shadow purpose that can speak truth? Do you have a Mordecai? Are you a part of a small group or a part of a church of people chasing after Jesus and in grace and love calling you to do the same thing and saying, no, that purpose, those ways, the ways of the world, the systems, they don't last. Focus on Jesus. He will guide you into all you need to be. Who are the Mordecais in your life? If you don't have a Mordecai, you won't know what your shadow purpose is often. You won't have the support to move out of it. Seek Mordecai's in your life and the best and only place to do that is in the people of God chasing after the same purpose. So Esther puts on her royal robe, goes and stands in the inner courts and waits in sight of the king. Could you imagine the pressure? At any minute she could have left. 
At any minute, she could have turned from her God-given purpose. And she waits. And I don't know, this wasn't in the message, but I believe maybe the Holy Spirit wants me to share this with you. That even in waiting, God wants us to seek our purpose. God cares about who we're becoming, and so should we. That's why the rule of life is so important. That's why spending time in the Word and praying and gathering with others is so important. So Esther waits, and then the king sees her, and he puts out his golden scepter in her direction. <sighs> She'll live for now. And then it says, the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is it you request? Even if it's half the kingdom, I will give it to you. Ultimately, he's in a good mood. If she would have asked for half the kingdom, that would have ticked him off and messed up his mood. But the language here is ultimately that the king is in a good mood. Somehow Esther has favor. We know how. But Esther has favor. And Esther is genius. She not only has courage and, and knows who she is, she also has been blessed with street smarts and tact. So she responds to the king, hey, before I make my request, I want to throw a banquet for you and Haman, your most honored noble. And the king can't turn down a party, right? So he does that. And she throws this magnificent party and they're hanging out and enjoying themselves. And then again, the king asks Esther, what is your request? What's behind all of this? And she in her street smarts and understanding what needs to be done in this context says this, if the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to another Banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. She is so smart here. If he agrees to come to yet another banquet put on by Esther, it's almost as if the yes is stamped and completed. And you need to know this. Esther is a genius. She is so smart that it's necessary to use wisdom and tact when following God's plan and purpose. Too many times I see Christians and pastors push aside tact and love and care and say that they're doing this in the name of Jesus Christ and they're actually hurting people. That's not who God is. In fact, Esther shows us that God uses wisdom, care, and meets people where they're at. And Esther does exactly that. So we have this banquet coming. Esther knows what she needs to ask. And there's that other character in the story that comes up again. Haman. We see that Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow for another banquet but all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see the Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gates. Haman has a shadow purpose and this is a very common shadow purpose in our society and among our people. It's the shadow purpose of more. Jesus isn't enough for me. I need more. I need material things. I need lust and pleasure and greed. I need more. That is Haman's shadow purpose. And that is many of our shadow purposes. It's never enough. I need more applause. I need more affirmation. I need more money and, and wealth. I need more comfort. It is never enough and a great indicator you are on the shadow purpose is simply discontentment. If you find yourself in a place of discontentment, then that means you are chasing after your shadow 
purpose. We know this because the Apostle Paul says, even in the midst of trials and beatings and facing death, he is still content because he has the greatest gift in Jesus Christ and his love. You see, one of the ways that you can measure your contentment, John Ortberg, who talks about shadow mission to leaders, where I get a lot of this ideas from, says this, answer this question, who is more content, a man with 12 children or the man with a million dollars? Who is more content? It's the man with 12, 12 children because he doesn't want any more children. Amen? I'm just kidding. Sorry, hashtag shelter in place, homeschooling. We're having fun, right? But Haman doesn't have anybody in his life to call out that desire for more. He doesn't have a Mordecai in his life. In fact, he has a wife that fuels his shadow purpose and tells him to build this giant gallow. And, and, and so he will be worshipped, God. Right, And then on this gallow, he can show everybody how powerful he is by hanging Mordecai, Mordecai and sacrificing him on this gallow. Haman has nobody naming his shadow purpose. And while this is happening and this gallow is being built, the king is trying to sleep before the banquet, the night before the banquet. And he can't. Sleep. So he asked one of his servants to read a book to him. And this book was called The Annals of the King. And the servant began to read about this king to him. And guess, guess which king it was? It was himself. Xerxes needed to be calmed by reading about all his glory. He needed to be reminded in his security of that he really was worth something read to him by a servant. And behind the scenes, we know that Haman is up to something. That is, the king can't sleep and is focusing that there's people behind him lurking and gossiping and trying to challenge him and push him more into his shadow of purpose. And we all have those kind of people who are behind us lurking, trying to push us against God's purposes. And you need to know that God is also at work behind the scenes and his ways last. So don't worry about those people lurking behind you or gossiping or trying to question your character integrity because if you focus on God's purpose, that will last and overcome. So as the king's hearing from these this servant about his great stories, he comes across a story about a man named Mordecai who found out an assassination plot to take his life. And that Mordecai literally, through Esther, had saved the king's life. But the king had remembered something. God was at work in that moment. The king had remembered that Mordecai was never honored. He was never honored for saving his life. So the king goes to sleep and the next day Haman arrives at the king's courts and he has no clue about what, what God has been doing with this story with Mordecai. And Xerxes asks Haman this question, what should be done for this man that I desire to honor? And Haman, stuck in his shadow purpose, whispers to the crowd and says, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? Haman thinks that Xerxes is talking about him. So he answered the king. We see this later on in chapter 6. In verse 7, he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, with one a royal crest placed on his head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes, let, the, let them robe the man in the king's delight to honor and lead him on a horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king desires to honor. And as soon as Haman's, Haman finishes, the king said, great, go get Mordecai, put the robe on him, and you can pull the horse. God had a plan in the midst of trials and crazy circumstances. And for Haman, it just goes downhill. And Esther holds this banquet. 
And it's in this moment that she truly finds her step in who she is as a child of God. And she says in chapter 7, if, you, if I have found favor with you to the king, your majesty, and if it pleases you, here's, here's my question. Grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had been merely sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. But because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? Who is this man that dared to kill you and your people? And Esther said, for such a time as this, right? She says, my adversary, my enemy, which is God's adversary and enemy, is this vile Haman. And in that moment, Haman knows what's about to happen. So he begs Esther for forgiveness and the king won't allow it. The king will not allow it. So the king hangs Haman on that gallow that he created, which is now dedicated for Mordecai. And Haman hung and found the result of his shadow purpose. But Esther, a mighty woman of God who overcame the trial and the circumstances because she knew who she was. She had positioned herself to remind herself who she truly was. That is a child of God living for God's purpose. She becomes someone that even writes law in the future. And Mordecai becomes the new chief of staff, the, the most highly favored noble. And Israel becomes the most popular and powerful province of all 127 provinces. It's even said in the scriptures later on that many nations from all over, different nations that never worship God, but because of this story, because of Esther and this time, knowing who she was, overcoming and living in God-given purpose, these people came to Christ. Every nation from all over came, came to God. And Esther had saved not only a nation, but many nations by God's strength. There's only one focus that we need to come to grasp with my brothers and sisters, and that is the focus of who we are becoming in Jesus Christ. That is the focus that we need because that will determine our decisions in this season, our responses, and our reactions. We need to center our life around Jesus Christ, who, who is Lord not only just Lord when we die, but Lord of our lives now. He's the one that gives us plan and purpose and teaches us how to live. And some of you are watching this now and you're deep into your shadow purpose. And if you don't stop it right now, you will continue to face destruction. But God is calling out to you. He is saying, I have a way better purpose I have a purpose that involves your character, your integrity, that will withstand every trial by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I meet you through my son, Jesus Christ. It's time to let go of your purposes of this world that don't last. It's time to repent and look to Jesus, the greatest example, who even had a shadow purpose in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he said, God, if it's your will, take this cup from me. And God said, no, that's not my plan for you. My plan for you involves a cross. And for many of us, we need to lay down. We need to allow those other purposes to die completely. We need to remove those from our lives so God's purpose can come in. And Jesus goes to the cross. He faces death and he overcomes for such a time as this 2,000 years ago. And even now, for those of you, you can feel his spirit in you. He's drawing you out of the shadow and into the light. It is time for you to repent and turn to Jesus Christ as Lord. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ as Lord. I come out of the shadows 
and into the light because of the salvation provided by Jesus Christ. Help me to center my life around Jesus Christ. All that I am is yours. Teach me. Show me who I am and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you gave your life to Christ for the first time or you want to rededicate your life to Christ right now, I want you to go online and click our digital connect card if you prayed that prayer and let us know we've got resources for you our connections pastor and associate pastor pastor sean will be in touch we have resources for to, to help you to know who jesus wants you to be and in turn his purpose for you so my brothers and sisters we must not be like the waves and go back and forth we must be grounded in jesus christ download the rule of life workbook. We're going to start a new series next week, but we'll leave that on the website for you. Begin to schedule your life around the things of Jesus Christ. You need to join our daily gatherings. You need to surrender every aspect of your life to Jesus. You need to learn how to pray, and we're going to help you do that. Join a small group and walk with other people who can be your Mordecai and show you the life that God has for you. God is not done with you yet. He is ready to teach you to focus on who you are in him. He gets the glory and you stand the test of trials and time. So as we respond, we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. We do this to put him at the center of all we do. That is his gospel, the greatest event in history that he went to the cross to die for us, to pay the penalty for our sins and the greatest love in the universe to help us to overcome and defeat death by his resurrection. You see, as we take communion, the Apostle Paul says it's important that we examine our lives that we ask the Holy Spirit to show us where we have shadow purposes and where we are focusing on the wrong things. But we do that knowing that we have the grace and the Holy Spirit to overcome. Amen? Amen. So let's read Matthew 26, 26. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat this is my body. You may take the cracker or whatever you have and eat it. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Partake of the cup. As we respond in communion, we also like to respond in a couple different ways. Number one, we do that through giving. Uh, Delanda already talked about that, but your generosity has been amazing in this season. We've been able to help single mothers pay bills and rent. We've been able to help families who have lost jobs with groceries and other necessities. We've been able to connect people to all kinds of resources, so thank you for that. Also, I'm so proud of you, Cross Culture Church, for your faithfulness and your tithes and offerings. What a great way to show God that you trust him in this season. And if you have a desire to give or you want to bring your tithes back to God, you can do that at greatneighbors.net backslash give. One of the things that we wanted to add into our response time was prayer. Prayer is so powerful. We talked about it in the message. So right after I get done here with you, Delon is going to walk us through some prayer. Bless you guys. Hello, everyone. This is Delonda Adams again, and I pray that you were so very encouraged 
from the message by pastor on today. Um, we want to respond with, in, with that message in prayer. So come and let us all pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the message on today. Lord, I pray, God, that everyone, God, that was tuning in was able to glean and take away, God, from this message, God. Lord, that they too have purpose, God, that you have a plan for them, God. And just like Esther, God, we can go to our king, God, and we just don't have access to half of your kingdom like Esther did, God. Lord, we have access to your full kingdom, God. Lord, you are our God that owns the cattle of a thousand hills, God. And Lord, you said that whatever we ask, God, Lord, you will give it to us, God, especially when it is your will to do it, God, in the name of Jesus. So Lord, I thank you, Lord, that even in this time, God, we will know, God, that great purpose, is not just for the elite God. Great purpose is not just for the pastor and the first lady God. Great purpose is not just for our friends and those that we hold in high regard, but purpose, great purpose is for each and every one of us, God. And you have called us to, to, to give glory to your name, God, in your own and our own unique way, God. Lord, for you have, uh, created us fearfully, God, and wonderfully, God. Hallelujah, God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that if we don't know, God, who we are, if we don't know our purpose, God, Lord, that we will come to you, God, our Lord, God, Lord, our, our help, God. Lord, we can come to you, God, and ask, God, and Lord, I thank you, Lord, you will give it to us, God. Lord, you will let us know who we are and you, God, Lord, that we are your children, God. Lord, we, we are your people, God. Lord, we are your daughters and sons, God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you will tell us what our purpose is, God. Lord, you will uh, give us the freedom and peace, God, that we so desire, God. And Lord, you will let us, us know that, God, we have a uh, uh, future and hope, God. Lord, we don't have to walk around in this time hopeless, filled with hopelessness, God, but we can walk around filled with joy and we can give you praise for everything because you are God and you are God all by yourself, God. And whatever is happening, God, we know that you are a good father, God. So we thank you and we thank you, Lord, that we can come boldly to your throne of grace and get help in our times of need, God. We can come to you at any time, God. We can come to you anytime, God. And we can be the answer, just like Esther was. We can be the answer to help others, God, to deliver and set the captives free, God. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. And we say amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. When peace like a river was in my way, when so
So glad you've been with us here this morning. Praise God. I'm Pastor JT, the Next Steps Pastor here at Cross Culture Church. I have a couple reminders for us this coming week. One, you can go to greatneighbors.net, our website. It's a great site, has all kinds of information. Uh, but the one thing I want to point out right now is that you can go on there uh, and uh, hit the little button that says uh, connect. It's a, a digital connect card. And you can go in there and give us prayer requests. If there's anything specific you'd love to have us pray for you for, that's the place to do it. Go in there. We have a team that will take that and pray specifically for your prayer request. Also, join us online for our daily gatherings. We'd love to have you. Well, we just listened to It Is Well. Praise God and, and all His glory. What a great song. Happens to be one of my mom's favorite songs. Mine too, but I love you, Mom. I want to leave us with this. Take this into this coming week. Ephesians 2, 14 of 15. This is out of the New Living Translation. It says this. For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in His own body on the cross, He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Amen? So again this week, take this into this coming week here. Like the song says, When peace like a river tendeth my way, or when sea billows roll, no matter what, remember, it is well with my soul. Take that with you. So see y'all next week. God bless.